Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. What is the truth? And I don't mean the Netflix version of the truth, but the real truth of going off the derech, off the path, leaving the Orthodox life and community. We've all seen the Netflix versions of that reality, but it is actually one professor, Naomi Seidman of the University of Toronto, who I think is exploring it more sensitively, more complicatedly, more interestingly than I've seen it explored in years. She has a podcast you have to listen to if you have missed it on iTunes still. It's called Heretic in the House, and it was produced by the Shalom Hartman Institute uh, in partnership with them. And it is a riveting broadcast, four episodes, and hopefully another season to come. Naomi at the University of Toronto is a professor of religion and at the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies. She's a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow and a fellow of the Kogan Research Center at the Hartman Institute of North America. Her publications include Faithful Renderings, Jewish Christian Difference in the Politics of Translation, and The Marriage Plot, or How Jews Fell in Love with Love and with Literature. She's a past winner of a National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies, and she's presently working on a study of Freud in Hebrew and Yiddish translation. Welcome to the broadcast, Naomi Seidman. It's great to have you. So um, happy to be here. So I love, love, love this podcast, and I'm so glad we're talking about it because it lives on on iTunes for anybody who has not heard Heretic in the House. Uh, find it, listen to it. It's only four parts um, with a conversation afterwards with Naomi. Um, I just want to get to the building blocks of Heretic in the House, mainly where did the idea come from and the title in particular. Thanks. Um, where did the idea come from? That's such a great question that I should have a ready answer to, and I don't. Um, I think it started my sense that I could be a voice for OTD. I think that started when I wrote a review of Unorthodox for the Jewish Review of Books that got a lot of attention. Tell me, let's define OTD just in case. Ah, yes. Uh, contested term, to make that clear. So if you don't like it, you're not alone. But it's a term that means off the derech, which itself needs explanation, off the path by which is meant off the Orthodox path, um, which was a term used by the Orthodox community for people who had left and then got reclaimed by some portion of the community of people who had left, by which I mean Facebook groups mostly, um, to describe themselves the way the word queer started as an insult and then became a self-defining category. And so you were writing a, uh, a review of Unorthodox and was and was this was the uh, the the Netflix yes special that went viral, um, and you were realizing just how the depictions of Orthodox life were through a lens that wasn't necessarily realistic um, and representative of the truth. Exactly, um, w the way it works is that these shows cater to a secular audience, and they describe an Orthodox audience, and they're presumably about the experience of leaving. So you think that's covered. But as a matter of fact, that particular set of voices is not represented in the sense that the fact that there are groups of people who get together and have discussions about, for instance, the show Unorthodox. In other words, we're out there, we're being represented. And yet what it is that those people are saying on these groups, which I only dis discovered a few years ago, um, doesn't seem to be part of the conversation. And I thought, well, let me, first of all, just let people know that those people who are being represented, our experiences are being represented. We notice, we care, we have things to say. Um, and let me try to give a little voice to what it is that people are saying in those groups um, about the ways that their experiences are being depicted. And the people in those groups are people who have left orthodoxy and are kind of finding commonality and conversation that is, I'm sure, much more blunt and honest than what we we normally consume, those of us who are not in, in those communities. Um, what was particularly standing out to you that was missing from what we hear? Like what, what was particularly either moving or surprising to you about those conversations? 
Well, some of it still hasn't made it into my podcast, and I'm still hoping I can do, I don't know, a season two somehow. I hope so, too. Um, and I, want, I would love to capture that, um, that kind of voice, the OTD voice, which is, you know, full of pain. I mean, it's such a painful and difficult experience, and it's so specific. And there are things that we all have in common that you go through the rest of your life, especially me. I left, you know, decades ago. I never... I, I barely knew anybody in the flesh who had left. So these Facebook groups are ways that you can have certain kinds of conversations, um, leaving aside the question of the myths, which I'll get to in a minute, but just that those people will get, including jokes. So including a certain kind of, you have to, you have, the basic position is you have to know everything about orthodoxy, but be able to joke about it and say outrageous things about it. So that's a, like a very particular thing that you might not actually do in front of other people who, first of mm. all, don't get the jokes. And second of all, you don't necessarily want to hold orthodoxy up to that kind of mockery. But in the groups itself, oh, especially around Jewish holidays, like what it's like to prepare for Pesach and all oh, that. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's an everyday thing. Like that's yeah. the big thing we do is make fun of orthodoxy. And I don't, you know, I teach Jewish studies. I would never make fun of orthodoxy in a classroom, for sure not. I get fired justifiably. Um, but the specific myth that I think I started with, that to me was so clear, um, and that everyone seemed to miss, is that the, the story of leaving orthodoxy functions as a kind of capital, cultural capital in the secular world. And to me, the big story that actually was accurate, that was missed, is that SD tries to um, get into that music school based on her just doing her musician thing. She has this bizarre fantasy that she's a, you know, a really great piano player. And she's not. She is, because, she's the character played by Shira Haas. In exactly. I hope I remember this right. Um, and then the, someone says, oh, just sing a Hasidic tune. And then she sings this Hasidic tune, and then she's in. So the irony of that, right? She's trying to leave. She's trying to become a secular person. And mm. all she, all that world wants from her is the story. And she provides it. And this is the great moment of triumph. The irony is just completely lost to the secular world, right? She Rahas is interviewed saying she finds her voice. That's her voice? Right. It, it's a thing that she was actually struggling most to to be free. Exactly. But one of the things that you, and I just want to back up here because it's so fascinating when you talk about the bottomless hunger for the story of leaving and that essentially you, you write or you say, it's so easy to feed this particular beast and this beast is so hungry. Why are people wanting this story so much? Like what is the appetite for the escape? I think it. I mean, I don't have the answer. And, you know, I got two people answering that question for me in different ways. So Zalman's like, of course, they're interested. Everybody's interested in that stuff. You know, you leave a Saudi Arabian harem, Saudi Arabian harem, and people want to know what happened to you inside. It's not a big mystery. OK, that's Zalman. I have a different theory, which I don't even remember if I exactly said it which is that there's a certain kind of insecurity about not being an Orthodox Jew. If you're even a modern Orthodox Jew, but certainly a reform, conservative, secular Jew, this idea that those people have something that we gave up. Mm. And I will just say that that's correct, I think. I think that, that that's justified and real. But in some way, there's there's a kind of insecurity. I don't think this is true of Israel, but it's true of let's say outside of Israel, there's a different whole dynamic going on in Israel, but this feeling of a certain kind of almost inferiority, like ascribing things to this community in a way that, that dismisses your reality in a way that makes your reality seem deficient. And to have a way of criticizing orthodoxy, I think scratches that itch. Right. If you hear from somebody saying, no, it's not that beautiful and great there. I couldn't wait to get out. It's an oppressive community. It's, um, you know, don't long for it. Mm -hmm. um, the insecurity, the um, 
the the um, I'm, I'm looking for the exact word. It's almost um, like self doubt. It's like the self doubt like, or an anxiety of authenticity. Almost. Yes, the anxieties about authenticity that are part of the ways in which people look at orthodoxy. And one of the things I argued is what's so interesting is that Orthodox Jews themselves feel it about the Jews of Eastern Europe or some other. In other words, it, it seems like it's part of the Jewish condition of modernity that Orthodox Jews are themselves not absolved from feeling, are not defended against. But the, this particular um, this particular fascination, I think, plays into that in a way that that relieves it a bit. Mm. You Maybe. Have, I mean, I'm sure there's many other things to say, but yeah, but you have wonderful characters that you interview throughout this podcast. One of them is Frida, who is the uh, tour guide um, in, in lower Manhattan. Am I right? Um, um, and, no, Williamsburg. Williamsburg. I'm sorry. And she realizes at one point, like they they want to find this vegan restaurant. She can't find a vegan restaurant. And she's like, how am I going to make these make these these folks, these tourists feel good about what they paid for this tour? Okay, I'll give them the OTD story, like almost like prostituting herself with this story. But I just want to, before you comment on Frida, quote what you say about her, which I love. What Frida helped me see is that this need on the part of the secular world for our story, whatever it meant for them, requires that we play and replay that one moment in our lives, tell that same story again and again. If you don't see the irony here, I'll spell it out. We went from being trapped in the orthodox world to being trapped in the OTD story. And the OTD story shuttles us back into the orthodox world we left in order for people to watch us escape it again and again because of something they need, which we pay for. This is what our liberation looks like. So the complexity of that, which is, again, what's so wonderful about this podcast is every time you think you, you assume something, you kind of turn it on its head. I turn that on its head, too, because the next thing I say is like, yes, we pay for it and we get paid. Um, and what do you mean by that? That you benefit? Well, I'm being interviewed by you, the amazing <laughs> Gabby Bunkerman in this amazing scenario. Right. This yeah. didn't happen when I wrote an academic book. Um, who cares? Right. I got I don't know. What, what do I get this like royalty check of thirty six dollars? Uh, the getting paid for it is something that I, you know, I resisted. I actually, one of the things about the, the podcast is that I, which I feel somewhat ambivalent about, is that I got other people to tell their stories much more fully than I told mine. And that I somehow managed to get paid, if you want to call this a form of payment. And by the way, no, I'm not getting actual... I didn't get paid either for the podcast or for this. You're not interview, getting rich. Which Let's just fine. be clear. You're not getting Hollywood money. Yet. And right. I'm not getting Hollywood money or actually any money for doing this work, but I'm getting some kind of publicity that's I never yeah. got in even, you know, with my fancy professor job. Um, I mean, not that fancy, but uh, fancy enough and uh, not complaining. And um, this particular story um, makes me, you know, gives me something in terms of, I don't know, name recognition and and ability to to have a platform to say what I want to say about certain things. So, um, yes, we get paid. So I don't want to turn it into a pity me oh, yeah. fest um, for sure not. And it's also slightly creepy, although this didn't occur to me until afterwards that Frida, well, Frida doesn't tell her story either. And I really like that she doesn't. And I'm glad that I didn't somehow persuade her to. But Zalman does. Zalman's story is amazing. I don't know what that podcast would be without him telling that yeah. story about being asked to put on a, 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 a esrog wool or whatever it is on his face to, 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 to come home for Purim. So and Izzy tells his story a little bit, and I just want to tell I just want to tell the viewers that Zalman was basically told by his his dad suggested it right because he shaved his beard. You could put on a fake beard if you're going to come home for Purim, and just that incredible irony of right. like putting on incredible. a costume on yourself for your family was extraordinary. I want to get to the families because that's part of I think 
I don't want to call it the romanticization of, of the rejection, but it kind of is this idea that people are going to be, sh- that people are shunned when they leave, that their families turn their back on them, rip their clothes like Tevya. It's the Tevya uh, Hava scene. I played Hava, so I, I always have the Hava reference. I have to bring it back. But, they, always but played that, Hava. that's one of the things that you turn also on its head, which is actually like a lot of people don't get shunned. It's not that black and white. Right. So um, one of the things I should say is that mostly people in the OTD world complimented me and said that I had touched on things that no one else had said before, that they felt were accurate about their own experience. But I also heard from at least two people who are OTD who said, actually, our parents did sit Shiva for us. And we felt very invalidated by what you said. So this is an opportunity to correct the record on that score. I appreciate Relatedly, but um, it does happen apparently. But I was working, I mean, not to defend myself, but I was working off of Zalma Newfield's research. So to give academic, part of what I was doing was publicizing in a, you know, academic research that tends not to be, you know, sociological research, doing in-depth interviews with 74 OTD people and then publishing an academic book that, you know, sells as well as other academic books and will never make it into the Netflix, whatever. And what Zalman was saying was so interesting and surprising to him, right? So he's an OTD person who got shunned for less than a year, I think it was, in terms of the hard shunning of you're not welcome home. And that's that's actually fairly common that you there's a period of hard shunning or there are some people in your family that hard shun you and others that soft shun you. But soft shunning seems to be the one thing that is not part of the cultural myth that people don't seem to know about. And what it is, is you're welcome to come home, quote unquote. You asked me about the title. This is what I meant by heretic in the house this central insight that some of us are in the Orthodox community, at least some of the time. And how are we there? We're there under a set of rules, um, not written in the usual way, usual places that the Orthodox world has its sets of rules for everything, but a new set of developing rules, which is how is it that the child, the atheist, heretical, whatever, intermarried child is allowed home home, into the house for certain special occasions or under certain sets of mostly unwritten rules, which can be described as don't ask, don't tell. By the way, I was a a gay from um, woman said she thought it was somewhat offensive that the OTD world was adopting these this queer language, but I'm not sure I agree. So I'll go ahead and it's not my language, it's their language. So this idea that we, you know, we we OTD people are, are often allowed back in some form for a certain, and, and that this is a kind of new thing in the Orthodox world for various reasons. This is what I was trying to describe. And that it's it's not as wonderful and beautiful, at least from my perspective, as it may seem. Um, yeah, so that's that that gets both at, at at the shunning episode and also the title of the of the whole series. You also talk at a certain point um, about Nebuch, this idea of like it's such a sad story, right? Like, oh my goodness, like, yes. and that 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 part of the excuse or the justification for someone leaving in your family or in your life is that they're they have so many issues that that they're playing out. It's a psychological almost a deficit that that is causing this. Um, can you just very briefly, because I know we're running out of time and I have so much to get to, but just give us the nebuch. Um, yeah. So for the secular world, people who leave the Orthodox community are, are culture warriors. They're heroes. They're brave people, right? That's the title of the fourth episode, I think. But in the Orthodox world, and I think the secular world doesn't understand this, at least, and I think this is more and more common as that world gets more and more interested in psychology. It's usually it's usually understood as a kind of that person left because of Nebuch, they had problems. Nebuch, they were gay. Nebuch, they were abused. Nebuch, and also what Nebuch, does Nebuch gone, mean? Is Nebuch, oh, is Nebuch, Nebuch means Nebuch means poor soul. Poor soul. Um, 
It's a, it's genuinely sympathetic. You go some, oh, Nebuch, they have cancer or something. It's a way of expressing sympathy for somebody. And I think there's also some sympathy there, but it isn't ultimately disrespectful and dismissive, as, as Yitzhak Schoenfeld says. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a way of not recognizing that people at least sometimes leave because they can't believe what it is that they're being taught. Um, and it dismisses the whole idea of heresy. And it's actually OTD people that tend to foreground what they're doing as heretical. As a, there's another irony there, as opposed to the Orthodox world that tends to go psychological. You also zero in, and this is the fourth episode you mentioned on that statement, you are so brave. And you said you had to fire a therapist for saying that to you, which I loved. And just to understand what is wrong with saying oh my gosh, you're so brave. You know, you're so brave to have left. It's because if you're OTD and you understand that what you did was devastating to your family and the secular world has a hard time wrapping its brain around the reality and the pain and the individuality of Orthodox Jews. They're just a faceless kind of patriarchy. And if you rebelled against them, good for you. Um, And when you think about, you know, your parents or your, you know, your siblings or, you know, this family that's been traumatized, the Holocaust survivors and, and, you know, targets of anti-Semitism, and you made their lives more difficult. You cause them a certain kind of pain that's not going anywhere. And the bravery that you're being praised for is a bravery of willingness to put your own sense of of, of what you should do ahead of those concerns, which is always, I think, going to be uncomfortable for OTD people on some level, even though, again, I don't at all mean to say, you know, I what we did is, 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 is praiseworthy, but it's easier to hear it from someone who understands what that, what that bravery consists of. You, you say in the podcast, so part of the problem with you are so brave is the way in which it just congratulates us. It ignores the messiness of our stories, that we are not always the heroes and they are not always the villains. I think part of, of what's fascinating and get hard about this is that you are constantly reminding us that these are not the enemy. The people you left are family, they're friends, they're a community. And it's not like you're saying there's no value to that community. We're really not saying that. I mean, I think one of the new trends in the whole, the way OTD people are presenting to the world, which it would be nice if, you know, Netflix picked up on is is people like Izzy and Frida who are doing their who who are genuinely interested in and have warm feelings toward the community that they left. They understand themselves to be ambassadors of the Orthodox world. Let me tell, and they don't think that all good is on the side of secular, the secular, whatever you call it. You can't even call it a world. I mean, um, certainly not. Um, and and to to be able to speak about. Um, what what is good and the reasons why you're right to feel that there's something there, even as, you know, Izzy also talks to that world and says, let me talk to you in Yiddish about what I think is a problem. So there, there are complicated nuances to this particular issue. And certainly there are OTD people who consider Izzy and Frida and probably me too, apologists for orthodoxy and, and, would wish for a more combative stance. So I don't want to say that my way of doing it is is the only way or Frida's way, but I do think it's 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 a service we can perform. You're so interested in this world. It's true we left, but but we're not just here to bash it. And there are things that we can say about it that are actually orthodox people can't in some sense because they're not trained anthropologists or sociologists or historians, et cetera. So, so this is a valuable perspective from, I think, on both sides. I mean, I have, I have orthodox readers of my work because they're not finding serious academic treatments of orthodoxy in their, you know, in art scroll and their publishing houses. Well, I would love to just end with the fact that you 
partnered with uh, the Shalom Hartman Institute on this, and, and I'm obviously a huge fan of their learning and their content and their conversations. And part of why I felt like it was perfect that you did this with them is that they go very hard to complexity. They don't oversimplify. And we are living in a time where everyone is oversimplifying everything. And it's part of why I think extremism is winning. Uh, so if you can just address just the idea of sort of refusing to make this a simple story and what has the reaction been finally, just to end on that, like what, yeah, what have you, um, what, yeah, the refusal to make it a simple story. I love that. The willingness to go deep, to look at sources, to do deep critical readings. It's interesting. And, and uh, David Svi Kalman, who was the senior producer of this, right. is actually the um, one of the two leaders, along with Mara Benjamin, of our research group. So this is what we do. I just did this this afternoon. I, once a week, we get together. We're reading a science fiction novel right now. Great. Ministry of the Future. And we talk about it. Um, I actually think that OTD is not only uh, in the same way that Hartman is, maybe, is a kind of hermeneutic. Um, mm. It's not just a, a, a life experience or a biography or a sexy story. It's And I get this from an OTD scholar named um, Roni Mazal, who wrote about OTD readings, which is you read all the old stuff and you read it differently. What strikes you, the message you get, is somehow... Is somehow off, off the derech, right? We're off the derech. We're bad readers. And yet the bad read, readings of tradition open them up in a new way. So I hope that Hartman, you know, recognized it or, you know, this OTD reading is yet another tool in the kit of approaching Jewish tradition. Um, and I'm very grateful to them for hosting it. Right. Um, in terms of what the reaction is, um, mostly positive. Sometimes, you know, the same old, same old questions. The two questions we get are, are you still in touch with your parents? I mean, all those like nosy Jewish questions that Frida was talking about or other people were talking about. But also, um, so why can't you just be modern Orthodox? So why can't you just be conservative Jews? And um, and sort of trying to get at the depths of of the specificity of those other identities. It's not like they're the rational, reasonable, normal way to be Jewish. It's normal to live on the Upper West Side and, you know, read Freud and go to the 92nd Street. Why? That's the right way to do Judaism. In some ways, what we need to do is, is show those as just as culturally specific as those neighborhoods in Brooklyn that everybody's fascinated by. We're not in those cultures typically. Um, and those cultures are not the normative ones for uh, being Jewish. It's it's a much crazier quilt than that. Well, Naomi Seidman, Professor Naomi Seidman, thank you for this podcast. I want to repeat the name again so that viewers can find it and listen to it. It's called Heretic in the House. We hope there's going to be another season. I won't say thank you for your bravery, Naomi. I won't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I will yeah, go say, ahead. I will say <laughs> your honesty and thank you for your uh, exploration uh, because this was riveting and these conversations will stay with me a long time. It's great to be with all of you for JBS and In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.